Welcome to our weekly worship service at Greenwood United Methodist Church in Greenwood, Florida, via YouTube and live audience. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this day, your son, Jesus Christ, entered the holy city of Jerusalem and was proclaimed king by those who spread their garments and palm branches along the way. Let those branches be for us signs of his victory and grant that we who bear his name may forever hail him as our Lord and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. In his name we pray, amen. My message today is coming from Matthew chapter 21, verses one through 11. Matthew chapter 21, verses one through 11. And scripture states, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her side. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding a donkey and on a coat, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They bought the donkey and the coat and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowd answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee, the word of God for the people of God. My message today is titled, Our King is Coming. Our King is Coming. Let's get into this message. The stage is set. The curtain rises. The last act of drama begins. Here comes Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. Perhaps 2.5 million people, whoa, that's a lot of people, crowded the narrow streets, converging on this holy city at Passover time. Garments were spread on the road, branches torn from trees, fanned the same air which carried shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest heavens. You know, all of this was not an accident. Jesus knew what he was doing. In advance, Jesus had arranged for a donkey. Two disciples brought it to him. It was not an accident that marked his mode of transportation. The book of Matthew reveals that Jesus set the stage for what we now call Holy Week so as to fulfill the prophecy spoken centuries before in Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 and in Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11 which states, say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, a coat the foal of a donkey. Call it the first century or call it the 21st century. The picture remains the same. Our king is coming. So now let us take a look at this king, our king. But first, we Americans are not too familiar with monarchy. We, will, we love to watch a coronation. We are fascinated by even pageantry surrounding a war already. We will even occasionally follow it at a distance. 
the royal gossip surrounding Prince William and Kate, Princess Harry and Meghan, although we're sort of numb when it comes to all kinds of leadership, seeing the weaknesses of kings, the weaknesses of prime ministers and presidents, yet who among us is not stirred up to rapid pulsation by the majestic strains of pomp and circumstance? Wow, we're about to inaugurate a president. Someone's about to be crowned king or queen. It is overwhelming to sense the power, the armament, the, the majesty, the aura that surrounds the presence of a man called a king. There is something awe-inspiring about raw power. We can add that there is something even awesome about all political and military power which marks the trains of kings, prime ministers, and presidents. However, however, there is one exception that being an encounter with a king called Jesus. You see, Jesus is a different kind of king, whereas most royalty comes determined to rule. Jesus Christ came determined to serve. Whereas most monarchs spend time building their egos while with the prerequisites of office, Jesus came, though, with a totally disarming humility. Whereas most kings ride white stallions or majestic Boeing 747s, Jesus, King Jesus, comes riding a donkey. King Jesus chose this vehicle of transportation. You see, the horse stands for war, and that is what people wanted during that time. They yearned for a leader who would set them free from the yoke of Rome. But King Jesus, our King Jesus, rode a donkey, a symbol of meekness, of peace. How different are the swishing of palm branches from the clique of cross swords or the deafening blast of a 21-gun salute. Most kings set themselves up for a hero's death. In the West Middle Abbeys of their imagination, they picture the heads of all nations standing in silent tribute as the world pays honor to their contributions. But King Jesus, King Jesus was different. King Jesus prepared for the cross. King Jesus prepared for a disgraceful kind of death marked by the insulting inscription, King of the Jews. His fellow monarchs did not fly in from all around the world to pay him honor. No, for our King, our King Jesus was a different kind of King. Know this, our King knows precisely who he was and who he is. Whereas most kings are not certain about themselves. In most cases, they have inherited their positions, but their inheritance comes out either an ambivalence bailed by the failure to earn their positions, or perhaps at the other extreme, a kind of bravado and strutting that comes from years of grooming by palace functionaries. King Jesus knew exactly who he was. King Jesus knew he was the Messiah, spoken of by the Old Testament scriptures. Critics made his eyes, but the record is clear. King Jesus dressed for the occasion, preparing himself for the kind of entrance into Jerusalem described by Isaiah and Zechariah. And those prophets declared that the Messiah would come. King Jesus will be one different from the average king. And this king, our King Jesus, will be humble, making his entry on a donkey. King Jesus willingly forced the issue. King Jesus deliberately provoked the kind of response he got in Jerusalem. That day which was entirely opposite to his past performance. King Jesus, whose whole style of life and ministry would want to shine away from publicity. King Jesus, 
who avoided large crowds when he could. King Jesus refused to take the dominant power-oriented stance of other contemporary leaders. But on this day, on this day, King Jesus put on the symbols of the Old Testament pathetic utterances. King Jesus declared in no uncertain terms by his posture and bearing, I am the king. Instead, our King Jesus, his triumphant entrance to Jerusalem was designed to seal his doom. He knew it, but they didn't know it. It was a catalytic agent which would stir the anger and arouse the jealousy of the religious establishment to a frenzy, setting the stage for the greatest event in all human history. Not only did our king know precisely who he was when he entered into Jerusalem, right now, King Jesus knows who he is as he enters the Jerusalems of our lives. You see, embodied in his presence that day and today is a transparent honesty which defies so much of our worldly leadership. Only hours after his triumphant entry into this city called Jerusalem, Jesus wept. Our King Jesus wept. And from my research in recent years, only three sitting American presidents have ever wept publicly. Some have weeped after they left office, before they came in office, but only three while sitting as presidents wept. Bill Clinton in 1994, George W. Bush in 2007, and Barack Obama in 2016. You see, for most Americans, we do not want to see our rulers weep. We demand that they be strong. We push them into an arrogance in the fear that they reflect too much of what we are ourselves and by weeping be discredited. No, our King Jesus was different. King Jesus stopped and wept for Jerusalem. King Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets, and stone those who sent you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. I remind you, our King Jesus, our King Jesus healed broken bodies as the blind and lame freely approached him the days after his triumphant victory we so quickly turned into the day of his crucifixion. Hosanna in the highest one day and crucified just a few days later. Our King Jesus did not keep them waiting. Our King Jesus did not flaunt his rank in their faces. The simple people, the people with broken bodies and shattered dreams, the people with bruised spirits, the people who hurt, in their soul. These people, our King Jesus took to himself. King Jesus did it then. King Jesus does it now. That is the kind of Lord, the kind of King that our King Jesus is. King Jesus wants to transform us through the regenerated power of his Holy Spirit. King Jesus wants to touch our lives and make us whole where our body, soul, and spirit fit together in an eternal complement. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 3 through 7 describes Jesus in these words. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But our King Jesus, our King Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. King Jesus was crushed 
for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. We're all like sheep. We have all gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Jesus was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent. Our Jesus did not even open his mouth. Jesus is a king who has compassion, but his compassion is not an endeavor to, to buy our favor. Jesus is not going to give away everything denying his own righteousness. Jesus tells us that we need what we need instead of what we want. Jesus tells us that the wages of sin is death. Jesus tells us that, the, that someday, that someday we will stand before God, our maker, accountable for all that we have done in this life. Jesus warns of judgment. Jesus warns of eternal hell, total alienation, and separation from himself. Jesus, the king who enters Jerusalem on a donkey, walks by foot to the hillside of Olive. From that perspective, overlooking the city that he loves so much and for which he wept, Jesus refuses to give a campaign speech as many earthly leaders would do. Instead, our king, our Jesus, he tells it like it is, predicting domestic breakdown, economic catastrophe, wars, rumors of wars, earthquake, famine, and all of the horrible desolation which you and I bring upon each other. That is the kind of king Jesus is. Jesus tell us what we need to hear, not just what we want to hear. Jesus talks about more than positive thinking. Jesus talks about more than picking ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Jesus tell us that we cannot succeed ultimately in our own strength. Jesus warns us to face up to it now and to come to him while we can. As I close, know this, our king is coming. Our king is coming. His approach demands our response. Either we are with Jesus or we are not. There is no middle ground. Our king is coming. Our king is coming. Jesus is riding towards us now. Jesus is ready to look straight into our eyes, but the question, the question, are we ready for his glance? That glance demands a verdict. Jesus wants to know whether or not he is truly our king, whether or not he is truly the ruler of our lives. And the final question, will some of us, will some of us shift our glance away or would it be that nod of affirmation which comes from one who is loyal in allegiance to the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, our king and our Lord. Amen. Just perhaps, just perhaps on this Palm Sunday that my message touched someone in a way so special that you now want to give your life to Christ. And if you make this decision, then just simply repeat with me and you will be saved. That if you just simply declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and you are saved in Jesus' name. Amen. It's just that simple. Salvation is free. Don't yell and cheer for him on this day and then crucify him a few hours later. And if you made this decision today, we rejoice with you and excited about your decision to accept Christ into your life.
And now as I bring this worship service to a close, from Palm Sunday to Holy Saturday, may God in his infinite mercy grant us a journey of renewal and hope, a time of prayer and reflection and joyful anticipation of our Lord's resurrection. May we live and serve this week in remembrance of Christ's love. We pray in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>